It does so many different things. So it's so much more than just helping with immune health. Vitamin C and vitamin A do too. We didn't dive into that, but I, vitamin D I prescribe all the time. We really want that level up because it modulates our immune system, decreases the inflammation, helps our hormones work better, good for brain health, so it's really great. But for immune health, we want to keep that level up and we're really seeing that we, vitamin D can be really great for all kinds of viruses, including that thing that's going around at the moment. There was research that was done out of, uh, uh, in Europe somewhere, that they found that people that were going to the hospitals had deficient vitamin D and people that were that weren't going to the hospitals had good amounts of vitamin D. So it's one of the easiest thing we can do to keep us from getting any bad pneumonias or anything bad happening from our virus and going to the hospital because it keeps our immune system strong and robust. Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Teresa, I'm a mom, I'm a health nut and a wife to a cancer fighter. And today I'm talking with Dr. Jake about supplements that you can take to strengthen your immune system. Dr. Jake? So I'm really excited to be able to talk about this because a lot of people don't really understand what they can take to boost their immune system. It's just such an important topic or what doses to take for to strengthen their immune system. So I'm really excited for this episode today. Well, wonderful. Well, let's dive in. But before we do that, I'd like to first remind our listeners that this is just a podcast, right, Dr. Jake? Yeah, so I'm not going to give specific therapeutic advice or what, to, how to treat your specific conditions. So if you have any questions about that, give our office a call by visiting integrativemedica.com, find our phone number, set up a virtual visit or an in-person visit. Wonderful. So before we dive into uh, building our immune system with uh, these supplements, I've got to ask Dr. Jake, how are things with you? Things are great. Just, uh, just busy. School's just starting and all the other activities are starting. So I'm just running my daughter around in her ballet and contemporary dancing. She's doing that six times a week. So me and my wife are just really busy. Whenever I get home from work, I'm just kind of driving around and taking care of my daughter with her dance. So it's been getting pretty crazy that way. Taxi driver. How old's your daughter? Yeah, She's 13 years old. Now you mentioned in another episode that you've got a daughter that who's, whose soccer team you coach. Is this the same daughter or a different daughter? Different daughter. So that's a uh, Evelyn. She's nine years old. Wonderful. And that, and that's four kids, five kids. I have five kids. Yeah. I've got lots of kiddos. Very busy. And two of them are daughters or how many daughters do you have? I have three daughters and I have two boys. So I started with three daughters, never thought I was going to have any boys and then ended with three boys. So I imagine then while you're busy running your daughters around to ballet and coaching soccer that your your wife then is home with the younger boys? So we, we tag team it. So sometimes uh, my wife's taking uh, my daughter to dance and then other times I'm taking the daughter to dance. Uh, many times I'm picking her up later. My uh, wife's taking her earlier before I get home from work. So yeah, we kind of tag team it. And I do have another daughter we have to take care of too. So one daughter and the other boys hang out. With well, them. I imagine all that running around and exposing yourself to all of these kids, especially in this upcoming fall season, exposes you to a ton of viruses and who knows what else you can catch. So I imagine yeah. given this topic today that you are taking care of yourself with some supplements to build your immune yeah. system. Yeah. My, <laughs> Wonderful. So, viruses all the time. <laughs> so let's dive into it. I know our audience is eager to find out what kind of supplements they can take to strengthen their immune system, especially now that this fall season is coming around, winter and so forth. We want to take extra precautions to, you know, just to stay strong and minimize sickness. So you gave me a list prior to us meeting. And so I want to talk about the first one I think is probably the one that's the most commonly known, but I'm not really sure anybody really understands why or how it works. And that's vitamin C. So can you please explain what is it and why does it work? So vitamin C is pretty great. It's an amazing substance we have. We as humans, we don't make our own vitamin C. So when we get sick, we don't make our own vitamin C like other animals. Us and gerbils don't make vitamin C. So we make vitamin C because we need it for our immune system. So obviously vitamin C is a vitamin. We get it from various foods, usually fruits and vegetables is where we get it. We get it from a lot more sources than just orange juice. But when we're going after going after infections, we need high amounts of vitamin C. So if we're just doing a preventative treatment, we do low do doses. If we're doing it, if you actually are sick, we do really high doses of vitamin C. Vitamin C is very safe. 
But let's dive into how it works. So our immune system needs vitamin C to be able to fight off infections. So when we get sick, our immune system is using it. Kind of think of it as the ammo that the immune system is using and it depletes vitamin C. And then we have to replicate and get more of that because then they're gonna run out of ammo and they're not gonna be able to fight that infection off and as well anymore. Also what's cool about vitamin C is it's directly cytotoxic to viruses. So it gives the immune system what it needs, but then it also attacks the virus by itself because it kills it. So uh, it's pretty amazing. So let's dive into what we do for that as a preventative and also what we do for that when we actually have, the, have a bug like a virus. When you're doing it as a preventative, I only take about 1,000 to 3,000 milligrams daily. You do it in separate doses. So if you're only taking 1,000 milligrams a day, you do 500 milligrams twice a day. If you really want to go higher, you could do 1,000 milligrams three times a day. Vitamin C is very safe. It gets eliminated in your kidneys really well. If you have kidney disorders, you probably don't want to take high amounts of vitamin C. Or if you're prone to kidney stones, you don't want to take really high doses of vitamin C. But if you're not in that category, no one's going to have any problems at all taking high amounts of vitamin C, even though this is preventative, so it's not really high dose. So let's say you do come down with the virus, and I usually like people to say, when you first feel that tickle in your nose and you think, oh, is it allergies? You need to start taking the vitamin C. Start taking it really early on. And you take 500 to 1,000 milligrams every two hours. So you're taking really book amounts of vitamin C when you're sick. When you do that, it's really going to fight this virus and keep it from replicating and causing a problem. Let's say you get some gastrointestinal upset when you do that. Let's say you get to like 6,000 milligrams, then you want to decrease your dose maybe to 5,000. So, so to describe that, let's say you get up to 6,000 milligrams one day, you take it six times, you get some gastrointestinal upset, then the following day you're going to take 5,000 milligrams, so you're going to take 1,000 milligrams five, five times a day, and you continue that till the, the bug is gone and continue doing that two days after your symptoms are, are eliminated. Now, let's, let's get real here. When you're talking about gastrointestinal issues for anybody who doesn't who hasn't experienced this or has never taken like higher doses of vitamin c are you talking about like diarrhea what are you talking about here <laughs> yeah so it could cause Get diarrhea and, some, and sometimes it could cause explosive diarrhea depending on the person but usually okay. it just causes uh, some di digestive upset a little bit of looser stool except if you keep on going you're probably going to get more severe diarrhea usually it's just some digestive upset and you get a little bit of looser stool that's when you're like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm saturated in my vitamin C, let's decrease the dose. Right. You know, my mom, when I was growing up, she, she, you know, she's pretty much of a health nut. That's why I, get to, I, I love talking about this kind of stuff. I just grew up on this. She would always tell me, okay, so you're sick. You're going to take enough vitamin C. She says until, you know, what comes out is, is, is the consistency of tapioca. Once you're there, she's like, then you'll know that you've had enough and that you can kind of back off a little bit. And I always thought that was just like the weirdest thing. But to this day, it's the advice that I give any one of my friends who, who doesn't know how much vitamin C to take. Now, next question, specifically about vitamin C, liposomal vitamin C, and then vitamin C infusions. Is there any role for this with just somebody who wants to build their immune system or strengthen it? So liposomal, you're going to get a more absorption of the vitamin C. It's not going to cause as much gastrointestinal upset because it's going to be more absorbable in there. So that's really great. It's more expensive and you could just do the cheap vitamin C and that's really great too. But liposomal will get that concentration of the vitamin C higher in the bloodstream and can be even more effective than the normal vitamin C. But again, the normal vitamin C is really great too if you can't get liposomal. Now, IV, like infusions of vitamin C, yeah, you could do that as a preventative. Let's say, and you're going to get 100 times to 1,000 times more vitamin C into your bloodstream if you do IV compared to if you do it oral. Because oral, you're going to get to a point that your GI tract can't absorb anymore, and that's why you get diarrhea. So you can't really get really high doses of vitamin C in there. So when we do it IV, it bypasses that, and it's really safe if done right by the right doctor. And it was really great on going after viruses and other bugs. Usually if we're just doing preventative, we just do lower doses of vitamin C, keep the immune system strong. You do it maybe two or one or two times a month during flu season, for example, and that can keep you from getting sick. So it's pretty great. And then if you do come down with it, if you do doing one IBC or maybe two, you're totally kicking it really quick. That's what I do for myself. I take it home. My wife gives me an IV and a, a vitamin C. If I'm getting sick, I'm done. The bug's gone the next day. So... Amazing. amazing. One day. That's, that's amazing. Well, thank you for that. Okay. So vitamin A, that's the next one on your list. And I know that works a little bit differently, right? Cause like vitamin C, you said that it can, you know, it, it's eliminated through your kidneys. So it's pretty quickly goes through your system. Vitamin A, I think is more of like a, 
it's typically given in like a, a fat, an oil of some sort. So let's talk about that. What is it? Why is it in an oil? How does it work? So it's called vitamin A. So obviously it's a vitamin, but it's a fat soluble vitamin. Meaning when we say fat soluble instead of water soluble, vitamin C is water soluble, vitamin A is fat soluble. That means it's more likely to be toxic. So if you take high amounts of it, it can be really hard on your liver and other things on your body. So you need to not just say, I'm going to take tons of vitamin A because it definitely can be a problem. Also, if you take lots of vitamin A, it can be teratogenic, meaning it can kill little babies and make them not form well. So don't take high doses of vitamin C, know what you're doing. And I'm going to help you kind of guide you through that. And I'm not saying that to be scared of vitamin A. Vitamin A is very safe if done correctly. But so vitamin A is very antiviral, has been used for such a long time. It was actually one of the main treatments we used for measles and was a great treatment for measles when we were doing vitamin A to help with that. So um, it works by giving the immune system what it needs to to fight the infection too, and also has antiviral properties. It works differently than vitamin C. I like to do both of them. I don't just do one of those. I like to do both because they're going to really hit the the immune system, uh, the virus, and they help the immune system in various different ways. Let's talk about dosage of vitamin A. So if you're just doing a preventative of that, you only need five to 10,000 IUs, very low dose. You don't need a lot of vitamin A. Don't do more than that. That's what you're going to get like in a good multivitamin or something like that. Okay. And if you are pregnant, uh, don't take high doses of vitamin A that I'm going to be talking about in just the future here. But when I do vitamin A, it's very short term and only for a little bit. And it's highly effective for viruses. So when we're going after, let's say you come down with the virus though. So you want to do pretty high doses. So you go to 25,000, maybe 50,000, maybe 75,000 IU, depending on how much you weigh. If you're a heavier person over 200 pounds, go to the more than 75,000 IU. If you're an average sized individual, go to 50,000 IU. If you're petite, go to 25,000 IU. And you only do this for seven days. That's it. Don't do it any longer than that and rotate it. So let's say you do it for seven days, you're not over the bug, wait for a couple weeks, and then do another round of seven days. But typically, if you do seven days of vitamin A and vitamin C and other things we're going to talk about, the virus is going to be taken care of. Now, because with the way that you say that, and I think it has to do with the fact that it's fat soluble, right? So the way that I understand mm -hmm. fat soluble is that it can build up because it, it can yeah. stay in your fat, it can build up in your system. And that's why it could become toxic because it, it doesn't de get depleted by the end of the day where then you right. have to put it back in your body like vitamin C. Every day you got to put it back in. It, it's building up. Yes? You're exactly right. It can build up in your tissues and be toxic for it. That's why you don't want to take really high doses for a long period of time. I know a lot of people, and I know I was taught this as well that because of the potential toxic effects of high dose vitamin A, some people will just do beta carotene. And I actually see beta carotene in most multivitamins that I see at the grocery store. What's the difference? And is that something that is a viable alternative to vitamin A? So beta carotene is great. I like it. It gets converted into vitamin A in, inside your body. And I like to do vitamin A, if, let's say you're trying to prevent a virus or something like that, or just build your immune system, that can get the doses up to the right amounts of vitamin, to get the vitamin A doses you, you need. But let's say if you are sick, you need to take pure vitamin A to have a great benefit. And I imagine it's because like, you don't need to spend more energy in your body when you're already sick to now have to spend time making vitamin A to just go straight to the source so that you can get the quicker effects. There's that too, and now you're going to be, it has to be converted, and you will never get the high amounts that you can if you take pure vitamin A, if you take tons of beta carotene. It's, a very, it's extremely difficult to do, and I'm not anti-beta carotene. It's great. I like beta carotene. I like it as a multivitamin more than having vitamin A in the multivitamin, but if we actually are, if you're directly sick, you take high doses of vitamin A, and you just need to do it right. A lot of people are scared of it because you're going to have some of the mild effects. That's just if you take it too long. If you take a short term, it's safe and great to do. Just don't go past the seven day mark, like I said. Good to know. All right. Next one on the list, vitamin D. And I imagine it's vitamin D3. Vitamin D3, yep. And I like to combine that with K2 because they work synergistically together, but we won't dive into K2. We're just going to talk about vitamin D3. So vitamin D3, guess what? That guy is a fat-soluble vitamin too, so you can get too much vitamin D. So don't go crazy on vitamin D. If you have one of those droppers of vitamin D, don't do a whole dropper of vitamin D. Usually that's 1,000 IU per drop. Typically, 
you got to look at the bottle to really know. But the, let's say you take a whole thing of that, it's going to be like 30,000 IU. You're taking every day, maybe 20,000 IU, which says it's going to accumulate and get way too high. It's going to make calcium be flooded out of your system and be really hard on your kidneys. And it's not good news. So just take vitamin D right. Don't take too much of it. Usually, Typical dosing is like 2,000 to 5,000 IU, depending on the person. It's probably best to go to a doctor and check your vitamin D level, making sure it's in the right range. I like to see it at about 60 to 80 to really for great, robust immune health. Typical range is 30 to 100 on your blood test. 60 to 80 is where I really like it to be. But vitamin D is really awesome. Vitamin D is more like a hormone than a vitamin. I don't mm. like to call it a vitamin because it works like a hormone. It does so many different things. So it's so much more than just helping with immune health. Vitamin C and vitamin A do too. We didn't dive into that, but I, vitamin D I prescribe all the time. We really want that level up because it modulates our immune system, decreases inflammation, uh, helps our hormones work better, good for brain health, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really great. But for immune health, we want to keep that level up. And we're really seeing that we vitamin D can be really great for all kinds of viruses, including that thing that's going around at the moment. There was research that was done out of in Europe somewhere that they found that people that were going to the hospitals had deficient vitamin D and people that, were, that weren't going to the hospitals had good amounts of vitamin D. So it's one of the easiest things we can do to keep us from getting any bad pneumonias or anything bad happening from a virus and going to the hospital because it keeps our immune system strong and robust to do that. So this changes based on what you're doing too, dosing wise. Uh, if you come down with the virus, you do high doses of vitamin D. And if you're just doing a preventative, you do lower doses, 2,000 to 5,000. Now, let's say you are already at the 60 to 80 range with your vitamin D. You don't have to do really high doses of vitamin D. You go to maybe 15,000, 20,000 IU for seven days. But if you're you sick, were, just want to make sure and clarify, sick. if you're sick, right? If you're sick, if you're sick. 15,000 to 20,000 IUs, if you're sick, if you if already are sick. in healthy ranges. If you're already in healthy ranges, you do 15 to 20,000 IU, and you only do that for seven days again. Don't okay. do it longer than seven days. So only seven days you do it. And then go back to that 2,000 or 5,000 IU that you were doing as a maintenance to keep your levels out of good range. So okay. let's say you never took vitamin D before, you never checked your vitamin D, and you're, you're likely deficient. I'm almost guaranteed you're deficient. I checked thousands of people with vitamin D, and it's very few people I've ever checked with that are vitamin D sufficient. And I live in a pretty sunny place, and people are getting a lot of sunshine during the summertime. And I still see the numbers of probably 30, maybe 40, uh, if they're not taking any vitamin D. So most people are deficient. But if you're in that group that already taking vitamin D, taking good care of yourself there, follow those ranges. So let's say you get sick and you have a virus, you want to go more to 50,000 to 75,000 IU for seven days. So that's really high doses and can be toxic. Don't do it longer than seven days and then go back to the 5,000 and that's great and healthy. Now, how does one know if they're starting to become toxic? What are some symptoms that might suggest, hey, I'm taking too much vitamin D? So you might start getting headaches, you might be start getting some body aches, you might get in some uh, gastrointestinal cramping. You're, if you do any laboratory work, your kidney markers are going to show that you have too much calcium in your body and your liver and your kidneys are going to show that they're not filtering very well and they're starting to not work as well as they should. Liver okay. enzymes can start to go up too. Now, for somebody who is outside all the time, you know, maybe they have um, a job that requires them to work outside or they just, you know, have a lot of like a lifestyle that's very outdoorsy. Do those people tend to still need supplementation? If they're using sunscreen, yes. If they're not, not usually. But most people use sunscreen nowadays because they're scared of the sun and burning them and et cetera. So most people go out in the sun for long periods of time, they're going to put sunscreen on. And then that's going to deplete all that uh, therapeutic effect of actually absorbing that vitamin D, the reaction that's happening in our skin when the sun hits our skin and makes it into vitamin D when we take a sunscreen. So if you're not wearing sunscreen, you could go outside maybe 30 minutes or so per day without any sunscreen. You're going to be great with the vitamin D level. And I, I actually prefer getting natural sun exposure for vitamin D than anything else. It's the healthiest way we're going to get vitamin D but we need to actually get out there. And then with the culture we live in now, most people just aren't getting out in the sun enough. So many people need to take vitamin D even during the summertime. But if, if you are one that's going to really be proactive for your health, you want to go outside, maybe get 15, 30 minutes, depending on your skin tone and how much you burn. Because the more pale you are, 
the more sun you're going, uh, vitamin D you're going to absorb, pretty crazy like that. And the darker you are, the more sun exposure you need to be able to absorb vitamin D. Interesting. So I almost wonder if you're darker skinned, you might be more inclined to needing supplementation if you're not yes. getting a significant amount of Yeah, amount I mean, of many times, uh, and in many instances, people that are darker skinned are more likely to be vitamin D deficient than others. And people with darker skin can take the sun much longer than the more pale someone is. Interesting. All right, moving on to our next one, zinc. Is that the same as vitamin A and, and C and D? Is it a vitamin? What is it? Zinc is a mineral, so it's a little, a little bit different in that regard. It's an it's a essential nutrient that we need, and it's needed for our immune system. So let's say we get exposed to a virus, it's going to deplete our zinc levels. And if we aren't taking zinc, we're not going to be able to fight off that virus or other bacteria or whatever bug you get exposed to as well. So we want to keep our zinc high and robust. And zinc is another one that you can get toxic exposure. So a lot of things we're talking about today, you can be toxic on if you don't, if you take too much of it, except for vitamin C. Vitamin C is extremely safe, no harm at all with it, except if you have some of those conditions I just talked about earlier. But you don't want to take buca amounts of zinc. And I think right at the moment, some people might be taking too much zinc. So hmm. only like 30 to 50 milligrams a day. And if you're doing 30 to 50 milligrams a day and you're doing that every day, you need to make sure you get copper because zinc will deplete your body of copper. And we need copper throughout our bodies to make our brains work, our cells work, all cellular mechanisms. There's so many cellular mechanisms that need copper. So if you're deficient in copper, you're not gonna feel good. So if you're doing zinc, do a zinc copper blend or make sure you get a multi that has some copper inside there if you're doing 30 to 50 milligrams of zinc. So that is just a preventative dose during flu time. I don't recommend taking zinc other times, except if there is a virus going around at that time. I would just take zinc maybe, if you didn't take it during flu times, maybe take it maybe only twice a week. So how are, how are we getting it then when we're not sick? Like what, what's, getting, what's the natural sources that we're getting our copper and our zinc in in other ways? I mean, like all nutrients we're talking about, you're going to get it from your food. So zinc is going to be high amounts in meats and uh, proteins, more. Uh, meats, proteins, nuts, seeds. It's usually higher amounts in those. There are some fruits and vegetables that I can't think of right on top of my mind that do have it too. So if somebody were um, not a meat eater, like somebody who's a vegan, would they be more likely to be zinc deficient? Yeah, potentially. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Interesting. Except if they're eating tons of nuts and seeds. So then a vegetarian. Because they right. need a protein source. Well, you know, I often find that a lot of people that, you know, I think Fritos and Oreos are actually vegan. So you could be vegan and not actually eating the healthy, the healthy foods that you're supposed to be eating. So I, I call it's good it to know. Those, those are junketarians, not vegetarians. <laughs> right, exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. So zinc, from what I'm gathering then, get it from your natural sources. But when you're sick, take uh, take it as a supplement. And then did I hear right? Was it 50 milligrams? If you can clarify that one. We could do that as a preventative if, if during flu season. Now, let's okay. say you come down with a bug. I'll go up to 100 milligrams. And guess what? It's the magic number. It's seven. Seven days. Just do it seven days. You're not going to be toxic if you do it. Don't go above the numbers that I say, though. you got to stay with these numbers. And you'll be nice and uh, good and safe and healthy and you're going to fight this infection off really readily. So 100 milligrams, seven days, if you do get sick, if you're just doing that as a preventative during like flu season or when viruses are roaming around, do 30 or 50 milligrams and make sure you get a copper. Wonderful. All right, now we're going to be diving into some ones that some people may not have heard of. Some of them maybe, if they're uh, you know health geeks like myself, let's uh, dive into this first oddball one that many may not have heard of, quercetin. Am I saying it right, quercetin? You can quercetin. say quercetin. A lot of my patients say that. I call it quercetin. I don't know who's saying it right, but I, I call it quercetin. And okay. a lot of my colleagues call it that. But it doesn't matter. If you've been saying it wrong, it's all it's all good. Who knows how so what is it? It's a weird word. Quercetin. It's what makes a lot of the foods that we have yellow. So if you look at yellow foods, especially yellow onion is really high in quercetin. And it is a bioflavonoid. So bioflavonoid is what makes our foods colorful. And that's kind of the newer nutrient we talk about is bioflavonoids and extremely powerful medicine. They're very high antioxidants. I know probably a lot of people when you're growing up, you need to eat a lot of different colors on your plate. Maybe you heard that and that, and they didn't really know much about bioflavonoids. They just knew that people that were healthier ate a lot of different colors and we need to eat a lot of colors. So that's quercetin, it's a bioflavonoid. It's very anti-inflammatory. It's also antihistamine 
But what's really great about quercetin too, it's great for our immune system, is it helps decrease cytokine storms. So let's say you get uh, exposed to a virus and your immune system gets way too stimulated, quercetin can help subdue so that if you take the right amount of that. It also is called a zinc iantaphore, meaning that it draws the zinc inside the cells more readily. So you're, let's say you're taking zinc, it's, it can be kind of difficult to get inside your cells and this quercetin helps you drive it, drive it in there and have a greater effect on helping it get in the cells and making it work more effectively. Wonderful. Now, is it similar to the other ones where you should only take it when you're sick, only take it for seven days? What are your guidelines? Quercetin is very safe. It's very difficult to take too much. I mean, you can take too much of anything. But uh, let's say you were just trying to prevent during flu season, I would take 500 milligrams a day. But uh, yeah, 500 milligrams a day just around the flu season is really sufficient. It's also great for allergies, so you take it around that time too. Um, sometimes you need to go higher than that for allergies, though, up to 1,000 milligrams a day to help with the allergic reaction. It's just a great immune modulator, great for your immune system. and also helps your immune system just work more effectively. But this is the one you should be way concerned about and be scared about taking but you can take too much and don't go crazy on it. All right, good to know. Next one, this is one that's um, been pretty popular, I think the last couple of years, especially in a lot of my crunchy mom groups and that's elderberry extract. What is it? How does it work? Elderberry is an herb. It has a lot of antiviral properties in it. Now it is sugar. I don't like people eating tons of sugar when they are sick, but elderberry is, uh, it's something I love to take when you are sick because of how antiviral it is. So if you come down with the virus, it's the best. It's not great for bacterial infections or fungal infections, but it's awesome for colds, flus, and other viruses out there. So it's awesome. So dose-wise, I only take I don't take this as a preventive typically, but you can. I mean, you could take maybe 500 milligrams a day during flu season. If you are sick, I would take like 1,000 milligrams three times a daily, elderberry syrup. Um, just look at the, the package and look at the milligram dosing. You could get really high dose uh, elderberry syrup and you could get ones that are really low and you're going to be drinking like the whole bottle in one day. So just make sure you get a good potent elderberry syrup so uh, you get the therapeutic effect. Now, when you're doing the higher dosages for you actually, when you're actually sick, should you follow the seven day rule? Yeah, I would. Yeah, exactly. Seven days is a great rule because mostly you're going to clear the bug in that time frame, anyways. And then it, almost always you're going to have it cleared by that point if you're doing things right. Perfect. Um, well, let's move on to another herb that's been around for a while, at least as far as like uh, general public knowledge of it, but I'm not really sure a lot of people understand how it works um, and if they're doing it correctly, because I've heard of people taking it all the time and I've heard that that's not right. So I'd love to hear from you. Echinacea. Echinacea, yeah. So Echinacea, echinacea is great. Echinacea purpurea. There's seven different types of echinacea. Echinacea purpurea is the one I use more for immune system stimulation. It's awesome. I only take echinacea. I mean, during flu time, there are people that take echinacea. I don't personally do that all the time, but it does help keep your immune system strong and robust. It does increase your white blood cell counts. I usually take it if you do get sick, though. You, you take pretty high amounts of it when you do get sick and you do that for about, you could take this for about seven or 14 days. It doesn't have to be just seven days. I'm kind of hesitant with echinacea sometimes, especially as a preventative for the autoimmune crowd is sometimes it can be a little overstimulating for them and kind of flare them up. If you do have autoimmune diseases, don't be worried about it at all. If you don't have an autoimmune condition, but if you do, you want to maybe be a little hesitant on echinacea, maybe go with the other things we talked about. I don't have exact dosing on this one. Usually, Pills are pretty similar in the dosing range. I take like two pills, one to two pills three times a day of echinacea, or you could do echinacea tea, make a tea out of it and do one cup three times a day if you are sick. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I agree. I've heard that before people taking it all year long and it's like, I don't know about that. Like that's, <laughs> you're supposed to only think to take that when you're actually sick, mm -hmm. you know, so good to know mm -hmm. and get that confirmation. Moving on one that I don't think a lot of people would have ever thought that this could help with building an immune system. Probiotics, talk to us about that. How does that work with the immune system? What is it, first of all? And then how does it work with the immune system? So probiotics are, are bugs, good quality bugs that we like to get into our gut. So we want good bugs, we don't want bad bugs. So probiotics are good bugs that work synergistically with our body. And we have been working together, our bodies and these bugs for thousands and thousands of years. So they're our little friends. So what they do is that you get them into inside your gut and then they stimulate your immune system. 
So when you have these bugs, you've got your immune system constantly stimulated and it's ready to go when you get uh, exposed to an infection. Also, probiotics are going to help you digest your food better. So you're going to get those nutrients you need and get in, uh, decrease that infection more readily too. Also, it decreases inflammation in your gut. So it's going to decrease that inflammatory response, which then makes your immune system not work as well, and then you're going to get bugs more readily. So it helps your immune system be stronger, more robust, and helps you get the nutrients you need when you take probiotics. I like to take about 30 billion per day of that. I mean, you don't have to take a pill, and you want to make sure you get a good quality probiotic because probiotics, majority of them on the market, probably 95% of them are poor quality, and many of them are dead. So some ways just to know if your probiotic's good is you... Make sure it's refrigerated, even though I have products that have been studied by third-party testing that shows that it is viable at room temperatures. But if you're just getting it from a random store, make sure it's uh, refrigerated. And make sure when you look at the back of the bottle and it says lactobacillus or lactobacillus bacillus acidophilus, it has a certain numbers behind it. Because then that tells me they're actually doing quality assurance and they have a specific strain and they're not just choosing some random strain uh, that's the cheapest that day. They're actually having quality assurance there for that. So about 30 billion per day of that. I think it's great to get it from sauerkraut, kombucha, kimchi, all kinds of other ways to get it. I'm not a huge fan of yogurt. That's just a sugar bomb, candy. Uh, it's not healthy for you, except if you get a plain yogurt and it's done appropriately and it's not. So here's, here's why I say this with yogurt. So you get yogurt, you're fermenting it. It's all great. And guess what they do? They pasteurize it. They kill all the bugs in there and then they give it to you and they say it's high in probiotics. And no, it's not because they killed it all in the heat. But there are companies that are uh, putting probiotics in it afterwards and then you're, you're getting it there. So really, yogurt's not the best place to really get it. Kimchi or uh, other ways are really much more effective. Now, and what I'm hearing from you is that probiotics seems to be more of a preventative. As long as you're taking it all the time throughout the yeah. year, it's just going to help you. So when you are, when you do encounter a virus that you're prepared, right? Yeah. I don't take it when you are sick. It's a preventative. Okay. So let's move on to the last. We've got two more and I'm really interested with these last two. I don't know a lot of people who know much about these, at least in my circles, uh, and want to know more of your thoughts on it. First one, mushrooms. Yeah, so mushrooms, I don't care what mushroom it is, it stimulates your immune system. They have certain polysaccharides in there. So that's just a fancy word for sugars. But there's so many different types of sugars and so many different sugars that have therapeutic action. Many times we just think of cane sugar or high fructose yeah. corn syrup or whatever. But polysaccharides in a lot of different foods and mushrooms are really high in that. And they're very immune stimulatory. So mushrooms are an awesome preventative of getting sick if you're eating mushrooms or drinking mushrooms to boost that immune system. We have certain mushrooms that are known to really be great for our immune systems, like cordyceps mushroom, chaga mushroom, we have reishi mushroom, we have lion's mane, we have all kinds of different mushrooms which are great on boosting the immune system that we specifically talk about. Turkey tail is a really big one too, especially in the cancer realm. But all of these really boost the immune system to go after these infections. Now, you could also take this at higher doses if you do get come down with the sickness. It depended on the mushroom, and I'm not going to go in detail on milligrams because it depends on the mushroom that you are taking. But let's say you're taking like a mushroom supplement that has reishi or chaga or whatever. That's going to be great, and it's going to have that immune stimulatory effect and going to keep you from getting sick or really get really mild symptoms because your immune system is going to be constantly stimulated. And you probably will notice if you start taking mushrooms for a while and you get your CBC, which checks your white blood cells, red blood cells, you're going to start noticing your white blood cells start getting higher, which is, which is awesome. Okay, good to know. All right, last one, colostrum. So colostrum, so we get that a lot in, uh, we get that in milk, we get that in our breast milk, so, and, and you also could get it supplementally. So you get it in your gut and it stimulates the immune system. I usually use this as a preventative. It always keeps your immune system up. I wouldn't do it all the time personally myself. I would take it just during the flu like uh, flu season time when there's viruses roaming around or there could be viruses other times. So if you start noticing that there's a bug around during summertime, I would take it during that time to really boost your immune system. It does other things, stimulates growth factors and things, uh, stuff like that, but uh, it's a great immune, immune help. Support. Now for the supplement one, is the colostrum derived from cow colostrum or what, what animals do they typically get it from several ways. Usually it's bovine. Um, but oh, you could get it from 
which is cow. It's just okay. fancy way of saying. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. uh, but you can get it from other sources. Uh, so they get it from several different are other areas, but it definitely isn't vegan if, if you're looking for a vegan product. Side note. And I'm interested in what your, your thoughts are on it. A little, a little insight into my life. My husband, this is actually a second round with cancer. When he was first diagnosed, first time around, which was uh, about six, five, five years ago, I happened to be, just had a baby. My daughter was born. And so I was nursing her and I had been reading about the uh, benefits of colostrum as well. I, you know, I would pump for my daughter and I would have extra ones in my, in my freezer. And I started putting some of them in my husband's morning shakes in just hopes that it would, now mind you, he knew. It's not like I was keeping it a secret for anybody who might be laughing. He did know. He was okay with it. Uh, and he was eager to get the benefits if that was the case. Am I crazy? Could, could it have, That's great. I could it have it. played a role in why he, he got rid of it the first time around? <laughs> Possibly. It does boost your immune system. So there is that possibility for sure. All right. Well, make sure though, everybody to talk to your doctor, obviously, about some of the things that we're bringing <laughs> up today. And so that does bring us to a close. Dr. Jake, thank you so much for all of your knowledge and helping us with supplementation to help strengthen our immune systems. How can people follow you, get a hold of you if they want to talk more about where they're at in their health? So if you really are having some type of immune issue, or you really really sick or you have other things besides immune issues, you can visit our website at integrativemedica.com, find our phone number, give us a call, and you can set up a in-person visit or a virtual visit and it'd be fun. Awesome. Well, we're looking forward to uh, our next episode. Thanks again, Dr. Jake. To everyone else, we'll see you next week. Hey, Dr. Jake, thank you for your time today. And if you enjoyed the show, then do us a favor and leave a review. It helps more people to find the show, which could save their life. And remember, this is a podcast and should not replace personalized attention from a medical professional like Dr. Jake. If you or someone you know has been diagnosed with an autoimmune disorder, cancer of any stage, or a life-changing illness, visit our website today and schedule a virtual appointment with one of our doctors who can lead you to a treatment plan in your area. That's integrativemedica.com. Integrative, M-E-D-I-C-A.com. Thank you for listening to the Integrative Medica podcast with Dr. Jake. To hear past episodes and get alerts for the future, subscribe to us on your favorite podcasting platform and be sure to follow us on YouTube as well. Just search for Integrative Medica with Dr. Jake.